Hey, David here, and I've got to tell you something. And what I'm going to tell you could make you look at me differently. It could even make you want to distance yourself from me. But I'm still going to tell you because I love you. I should also share that what I'm going to show you, it is strange. And I think that most of what I present will challenge how you look at life. And you should probably also know that this video is infused with my faith in the scriptures and how I believe that his word is truth. But please, I am asking you to watch every single minute of this video, just so that you can look at it all and you can evaluate everything yourself. But I'm more confident about all of this stuff than ever before. And that's why I'm finally showing you this. Because it is not in my best self-interest to be vocal about any of this. Because I've got a pretty solid thing going in life right now. So I kind of look at it like, why would I want to do anything to disrupt that? I'll tell you it's because there is something burning inside of me, and it's compelled me to document this strange truth project. Also, I really feel like I just need to get my record on file, and straight up, I really want to share it with you. That's all I really have to say for now, so let's get into it. Copyright and Fair Use Disclaimer this educational video may contain copyrighted material, the use of which has not always been authorized by the copyright owner. We are using this material strictly for educational purposes only. We believe this constitutes a fair use of any such copyrighted material as provided for in Section 107 of the U.S. Copyright Law. In accordance with Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107, the material used in this video is distributed without profit. The views expressed in this video are solely the views of the creator of this video teaching and not to reflect on the copyrighted material directly. Hashtag Team Yahawashai. This is the moon as seen from Northern California. I used my Nikon Coolpix P900 to record this. It's actually pretty amazing how close I can zoom in on it. Just how clearly I can see it, even in the daylight. I can actually zoom in closer to craters to look at those if I want it. Yeah, I've gotten pretty good at zooming in on this stuff in the sky. This is Jupiter. It's a planet, as I'm sure you've heard. It's one of the gas giants. I didn't really know very much about Jupiter or much about anything in outer space until I started recording the sky using my camera. But you can see this here, Jupiter looks really cool. It seems to have waves running through it, there's a flickering within it, and it looks a lot like a glowing light. This is Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun. It's the second brightest natural object in the night sky after the moon. If you didn't know, Venus is a terrestrial planet and it's sometimes called Earth's sister planet or twin because of their similar size, similar mass, similar proximity to the sun. Here's Venus slowed down a bit. Venus seems to have waves running through it too. Venus isn't the only object in the sky that does this though. So let's look at a few stars. This is Vega. It's the fifth brightest star in the night sky, and it's the second brightest star in the northern hemisphere, which is where I'm at in the United States. But just look at it. There are some really unique colors in there. It also looks like it's pulsing and waving and moving around inside of it. It also has these ring-looking things going around inside of it from its center to the edges. And just like Venus, Vega has some kind of dot right in the middle of it. But let's look at another star. So this is Arcturus. Arcturus looks like a disco ball with so many amazing colors flashing inside of it. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the sky and the brightest star in the northern celestial hemisphere. It's straight up amazing and beautiful. This is Polaris. It's also called the North Pole Star, which is also in the Northern Hemisphere. Notice how this star doesn't move across the frame of my camera. Remember how all of the previous objects I showed you so far, they moved pretty quickly across my lens when I recorded them. Well, as you may know, Polaris doesn't move more than a degree, and all of the circumpolar stars in the Northern Hemisphere rotate around Polaris. I'm curious if you've ever seen recordings of planets or stars in the night sky like what I just showed you. Because there's no doubt 
the moon looks the same as what you've probably seen, but when it comes to planets and stars, I bet that you've primarily seen images like these. I think it's odd how different these online images look versus what I actually recorded and what I actually observed with my camera. I just wish that some of the normal observations came up at the top of some of the online searches I do. I found a lot of things odd and kind of strange and surprising recently, and that didn't start happening until this year, 2017, because I actually started looking up. I started looking at the daytime sky, started looking at the clouds and how different they can be from one day to the next. I looked at planes flying across the blue sky. I looked at the sun behind the clouds. I looked at the clouds floating across the sky and I started paying attention to the moon in the daytime, in the nighttime. I started looking at the moon's different phases, its different colors. This is a waxing crescent moon. This is a full moon. And like I mentioned earlier, I bought a unique camera to record all of this. It's the Nikon Coolpix P900. I bought it to personally study all of these things as I looked up and took some interest in the sky. And my interest in the sky and my studies, they led me to look into the missions in outer space. First, I looked into the Apollo missions to the moon. Then I wondered why we hadn't been back to the moon in 45 years. I wondered why even now we didn't at least have a fleet of rovers scouring every inch of the moon including its other side that we didn't even land on. But apparently there's a competition to get rovers on the moon. But I mean, we have a rover on Mars. Why didn't we at least send one rover up to the moon to constantly observe it since we no longer send humans? It's just hard for me to imagine that we've already discovered and observed everything we could learn about the moon during those three years of Apollo missions. You know, we've never put a woman on the moon, only men. So why not send our first woman to the moon? That would be a spectacular accomplishment. At least I think so. But then I came across a video of Don Pettit. He's a very outspoken NASA astronaut who's been to outer space three times. He said this is why we haven't been back to the moon. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and it's a painful process to build it back again. Then I found out about the Van Allen radiation belt. Here's what a NASA engineer has to say about the Van Allen radiation belt. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous, radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. So yeah, I found it really interesting what that NASA engineer said about the Van Allen belt. And it turns out that other NASA folks have said the same thing about leaving low Earth orbit. And what comes after the International Space Station once its mission is over? How do we ensure the presence of humans in space? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today. And it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is gonna allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. 
kinds of technologies that we're testing out on Space Station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. So we have a really robust exploration program at NASA. And here's a quick look at the technology that we used to make it to the moon. Here's an image of the command module being rescued in the ocean. This made it to the moon and through the Van Allen belt and back to Earth. Here's video of a command module taking off from the moon. Here are some images I downloaded from NASA's website showing the module and a close-up of the technology that we sent to the moon. So yeah, I was surprised to hear about the Van Allen belt because we went to the moon nine times and sent 12 men during the Apollo missions from December of 1968 to December of 1972. I'm kind of a detail-oriented guy, so I wanted to learn more about all this because while I'm detail-oriented, I'm also pretty cynical and extremely curious about things that don't immediately click, but I got sidetracked during my research because I came across Neil deGrasse Tyson saying something kind of weird. If you didn't know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist, and he's pretty well known inside the science community. So here's what he said. <laughs> so, um, so, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And so Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's, an, it's oblate. And officially, it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. I researched this statement because it didn't make sense to me. And yeah, if you watch the whole video of when he says this, he gets into sea levels and more. But I got to tell you, he didn't mean the statement as a joke. But it still seems like a joke because who says the Earth is pear-shaped? Pretty odd, right? Either way, his statements and my research led me to download just more images and more videos from NASA's actual website. These are a few of their images of Earth that they took from space. And as I was downloading and researching photos and videos at NASA's website of our first moon landing, yeah, the Apollo 11 mission, I discovered something pretty crazy. Apparently, NASA lost the tapes that recorded data of the original Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969. The tapes included biomedical data on astronauts, video footage of the Apollo 11 landing, and all of their telemetry and engineering data. But based on everything I can research, it seems that NASA actually lost not just the Apollo 11 telemetry data, but NASA lost all of the telemetry data from all of the Apollo missions that landed on the moon. That's well over 10,000 lost tapes and over a ton, literally a ton in weight of missing tapes. Fortunately though, they were able to restore the original moon landing footage that was broadcast to Earth. I guess I just found it pretty odd when you consider that the moon landing is one of the, if not the, greatest accomplishments by mankind because I figured NASA would take really good care of that stuff and properly label boxes and reams of recordings. Okay, so that seemed pretty careless. But then I stop and think, wouldn't right now be the perfect time to go back to the moon? We've made significant breakthroughs in technology in the past 45 years. So imagine today's technology that NASA could bring to the moon to record and study it. Imagine the beauty that they could show the entire world. Because we could have crystal clear, high definition footage taken directly from the surface of the moon. I mean, 4K resolution stuff that would blow everyone's minds. But instead, everyone seems to be okay with not going back. And that's despite the original video of our first ever moonwalks during the Apollo 11 mission being destroyed. And they say the original recordings, they were actually super clear and nothing like the grainy video that was broadcast to millions on television. But I guess it doesn't really matter either way, since we destroyed the technology to get back to the moon. That's if you believe what Don Pettit said. So my curiosity compelled me to keep researching all of this stuff. And a lot of what I found, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, why does it look like this flag is flapping or blowing in the wind? And this module taking off looks pretty weird to me. So yes, 
a lot of the moon landings and stuff surrounding outer space can come across as odd. And yeah, maybe each odd thing can be explained away. It's just that when I look at all of the oddities as a whole, it's a bit creepy. And I say creepy because someone I know and someone I love once said this stuff was creepy when they started looking into it. And all of this creepy stuff made me want to keep researching and keep asking questions. But I ended up asking one question that can get you labeled as a nutcase. It's a question that makes people laugh at you. It's a question that I bet you've already seen coming as you've been watching this video. And that question is, did we really go to the moon? I'm sorry, Jay. No, I'm no, sorry. I, I could see that how that would affect your Christmas. I made, I made that whole thing up. What? Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I just wanted to seem interesting. I, I guess there's a, there's a real danger of that on this show. But there's a know? pressure. Of, well, yeah, people come yeah, out sure. and they just, they've run out of anecdotes, you know, yeah. and, they, and, uh, and they just start making stuff up. Yeah. Like that Neil Armstrong guy. Have you seen him on the talk shows? Neil Armstrong? Do you mean the first man to walk on the moon? Talk about a fish story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, and they're buying it. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yep, we all know that people get labeled crazy or get called conspiracy theorists for questioning the Apollo missions or if we ever went to the moon. But please stay with me here, okay? I promise that I've really given this a lot of thought and I've considered how something like this could actually happen. And since we no longer send people to the moon, I started looking into other info and footage surrounding outer space. And I found some interesting things there too. This is Gemini 4 that was completed in June of 1965. That was well before the Apollo 11 mission. This is the first American spacewalk recorded using an 18 millimeter lens camera. And it recorded at six frames per second, but straight up, this looks like stop motion video to me, back to what's odd. And it's that I can't find any other video of astronauts turning their helmets. A turning helmet appears to be only happening during this first ever spacewalk. Because the thing is, is that my research showed that the helmets couldn't turn or swivel because they're fixed to an airtight ring base. And once the suit is pressurized, it all becomes extremely stiff. And I don't see the helmet turning again in any of the video for this spacewalk or any others. But there's a lot of footage available that's been taken from the International Space Station, the ISS. This is it here. Of course, a lot of live interviews and videos have been done and recorded from the ISS. And that's resulted in a lot of footage to look at. First, and this one's just kind of really funny to me, it turns out that there's a lot of weird looking hair on the space station. It's like the hair is gelled or hairsprayed up, like straight up, and it's not supposed to move. Why not just let it flow and showcase its weightlessness? Maybe it would get in the way, but there are also ponytails and such, right? You look like you're in a studio, maybe in Omaha, Nebraska or something. The, the, the shot is so clear. Is this a hoax? Are you really in space still? See the hair? Okay, this is a good place to freeze for a moment and transition because things go from questioning weird hair to deeper levels of strange. See the hair? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have to do something for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I want to do it. I know. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Watch Come this. On. It looks like this guy is grabbing a wire attached to the guy next to him. He's not grabbing air. And there is no reason why any of these guys would be wearing wires in space. Someone I know wondered that when I showed them this video. Believe me, you're going to be just like the person I talked to because you will look for answers. You will look for ways to rationalize these things that I show you. Just understand I've asked the same questions. Why, how, and what am I really seeing? This guy with the red shirt looks like his shirt is being pulled by a wire. There are lots of these instances out there that you can research, but it's not exclusive to the ISS. It also happened on the moon itself, and I'll show you that in a moment. But look at the guy in the middle of these men. He looks like he's actually wearing a harness. This was a live interview with Boise State, and look at how awkward this is. 
Look at this astronaut who turns with his back to us. Pay attention to his back heels. It seems like there may not be enough slack so his heels stay off the ground. Okay, maybe that's hard for you to believe or see, but look at this awkwardness. This astronaut looks like he's being yanked up by a cable. So how does he get up like this on his own? I mean, the other astronaut did not pull him, but it looks like he was lifted by some external force outside of him, and it's not the guy next to him. Straight up, it appears that these astronauts are attached to cables or some kind of harnesses at times because it pulls the astronauts in unnatural ways. It even prevents them from falling all the way down. Sometimes they look like puppets on strings due to the way that they're being pulled or moved along. But how else could they be doing this? Well, it could be more special effects and likely something called augmented reality and or green screens. And this is what it looks like. This is an actual video that NASA did. They meant to do this. This is an example of augmented reality. And then there are chroma key screens. So outside of green screens, there are also blue screens. And that's what you're seeing right here. You're seeing the former president being pushed through this NASA area, and behind him is Tim Peake, an astronaut, with what looks like a blue screen, a chroma key screen right behind him. And do you see the green ball? I mean, we can compare footage around that same time compared to what was caught on camera, and you can see it's the same background. It looks like the same deal. And I've only ever found one other video that's ever shown this same checkered blue screen. This is that one other video that I'm showing you right here. But how coincidental is it that they use this blue checkered background, which is extremely similar to ORAD virtual set technology? I mean, this is the kind of stuff you can do on a budget right here, this video. Now here's something else from the ISS. Look at this card floating. This is directly from NASA's YouTube channel. This card, it just doesn't look real. Is there an air conditioner on up there? I mean, look at it. It looks like they're doing everything they can not to laugh. Next. People say that the spacewalks may have been recorded underwater and not on the moon at all. Because, as you can see here, astronauts are definitely trained underwater. So a lot of folks believe that they may have faked the spacewalks by doing it underwater as well. And that seems to make a lot of sense when you study a lot of the spacewalk videos. Because you're going to see what looks like a lot of bubbles going all these different directions. Who knows which direction the camera was actually pointing when these were recorded, but they look like air bubbles escaping maybe from underwater pools where some of these things were recorded or faked. Last, there are zero gravity planes. The only way right now that we can simulate the gravity on moon, Mars, asteroids is parabolic flight. So yeah, there is likely hours of video of real weightlessness that people have experienced. But you can't do that all the time. So there needs to be other options, especially for the longer videos, like I showed before. Okay, this is a time-lapse video of Earth recorded from the ISS. But I want to step off the space station right now. I want to look at the Apollo 11 crew's first public appearance after returning from the moon. It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. Oh. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. 
So a lot of people question that video and the emotions that they showed at this press conference, especially Neil Armstrong, who was in the middle. But yeah, it looks like maybe they were impacted by being on the moon. That could be a significant moment. Just as a heads up, this news conference occurred on September 16th, 1969, and these astronauts returned to Earth on July 24th, 1969. So yeah, it's less than two months for them to get their bearings, but it turns out that they did forget a lot in that short time frame. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I can't imagine that he was debriefed and that kind of question wasn't asked. What he saw, what he felt, what he experienced while on the moon. And now listen to Mike Collins, who was sitting to the left of Neil Armstrong. I don't remember seeing any. Neil, you were uh, a little bit concerned you said about... So now Mike doesn't remember seeing any stars either. We have to remember that the reporter asked about them looking up at the sky and if they could see the stars based on the circumstances. So Mike Collins' answer has got to apply to his experience in the command module itself because he didn't walk on the moon or go down to its surface. But let's look again at Neil's response to what Mike said. I don't remember seeing any. Neil, you were uh, a little bit concerned you said about Notice his body language, and it looks like Neil even whispers something under his breath to Mike. Was he telling him to simply shut up? I don't know, but the interaction looks really odd to me. All right, here is another interview with Neil Armstrong. And right after I show you this quick piece, I'll immediately share a few more statements made by other astronauts who shared what they could or couldn't see while in outer space. Mr. Armstrong, I do realize that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, deep black uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the earth and the moon. The, uh, the earth is the only visible object other than the sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. In from Mark space. Cameron. This is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see. Yeah. yeah. So you can see the stars. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. The sky is uh, deep black. Uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. Space, and you're on the sun side of the orbit. Uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight, so you can't see any stars, just like here on Earth. There's all the, there's all the stars there, and the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Yeah, you can, and there's more than stars. You can see planets, you can right. see moons. You, you see the, ga the gas... Uh, Magellan clouds of yeah, the Milky yeah, Way galaxy. The Magellan. Pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. Then when you look out into deep space away from the sun, it's the darkest black you can imagine. So this black space you're looking at on your screen right now could or couldn't be what you see when viewing outer space from outer space. I guess you have to go to outer space or walk on the moon to confirm this truth for yourself. But I'm going to stay focused on the objects in outer space because I want to ask why the images of stars and planets taken by satellites in space look so different to what I actually observe with my camera. Here's Venus again, as seen through my Nikon P900. Here's Arcturus again. Here's Vega again. Here's another star, Antares. It looks pretty cool too. I showed you my online research earlier, except I can't find any video of these amazing stars or planets that were taken by NASA. Now we're looking at NASA's website. From a million miles away, NASA camera shows moon crossing face of Earth.
It says a NASA camera aboard the Deep Space Climate Observatory Discover captured a unique view of the moon as it moved in front of the sunlit side of the Earth last month. The series of test images shows the fully illuminated dark side of the moon that is never visible from Earth. The images were captured by NASA's Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera, EPIC, a 4 megapixel CCD camera and telescope on the Discover satellite orbiting 1 million miles from Earth. First off, that looks very similar to the same side of the moon that I look at. Be interested to know if it's identical. But here below it says this animation features actual satellite images of the far side of the moon illuminated by the sun as it crosses between the Discover spacecraft's Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera EPIC and telescope. This is supposed to be the moon passing the Earth from a million miles away. So yes, at the same time, I'm criticizing and thinking that their video, their animation doesn't even look real. But I'm also still wondering why we just don't have more videos by NASA of outer space itself. But there are some recordings out there. There's the Cassini spacecraft out there near Saturn that recently plunged into Saturn. And then there is the Juno spacecraft observing Jupiter. But I'm sorry, all of these look like CGI images to me. They just don't look real. So these spacecraft are satellites, right? What about satellites in general? I looked up satellites online and the satellites are all CGI or fake looking images when I searched them. That doesn't prove anything, but it's another place where primarily CGI images are found when you start researching this kind of stuff. And I do think there's a lot more CGI out there because there's more stuff that just doesn't seem right when you start looking into it. Like the SpaceX missions. These are landings recorded by SpaceX and published by them. This is CRS-6. This is CRS-8. This is CRS-10. This is CRS-11. Again, this just doesn't look real to me. And how can a rocket steer a landing like this? These rockets are like huge, massive, heavy sticks except they can rocket to the ground in reverse. They can take off right, re-enter, flip around, and come to the ground in reverse and land with this kind of crazy precision using these tiny little fins. They're not even fins. They don't have wings. So yeah, this is a lot that I'm showing you, a lot that I'm asking you to question. But that's because there's a rabbit hole of random things that just don't make sense. And they don't look real. And then there is a film positioning itself as a documentary called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. And while it looks like there's some disinformation in this video, it does address a few things that kind of make you think twice. It does seem to address some valid questions. Here's some video from it. The cost of the three moon rovers in 21st century currency nearly $60 million each, though they had fewer parts than a Jeep. Where was all this money going? Then there's the flag, blowing in the wind, at least twice, on the atmosphereless moon. Here the editor cuts to a still shot of the flag, just as the effect becomes noticeable. Here it is unchecked. This rare clip, attained decades ago, was never re-released with the inevitable increase in experience and scrutiny. To demonstrate one-sixth gravity, a bouncy, floaty feel to the astronauts' movements would be similarly achieved with relative simplicity. Slow motion. You are viewing the scenes as they aired more than 30 years ago. Now let's look at them with the speed doubled. It becomes discernible that they are, in fact, in Earth's gravity and are no more leaving the ground than they would on Earth. 
It is clear from these rarely seen color television pictures that the crew of Apollo 11 brought a high resolution color video camera with them on their mission. Yet the only pictures broadcast live from the moon's surface were these from a low definition black and white camera. In fact, the networks complained because in addition to this, they were forced to shoot the images second generation off of a projection TV of the technology of 30 years ago and were not even allowed to take a direct feed, which further degraded the quality and clarity of the images. Perhaps this was precisely what NASA and the federal government had in mind. After all, it was a first, regardless of where they were. Better to open up their debut mission with fuzzy pictures and numerous blackouts rather than show too much revealing detail of a false scene that was yet unproven. And finally, the element that seals their fate. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discussed that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Hi, uh, Roger, Neil. We just wanted a narrative such that we can, when we get to playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a... Uh, the uh, number one window, and there isn't any uh, reflected light. And we only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. This is where the astronaut is back in view, but the lens was supposed to be on the window. Is it legitimate? I don't know. There's just so many weird things about the Apollo missions when you research them. And again, I'm not vouching for a funny thing happen on the way to the moon, but it does address a few questions that seem to make sense, that seem to be worth asking. And then there are the space shuttles, which are supposed to be gliders when they re-enter our atmosphere and they land. So space shuttles don't have the appearance of what you would think is a glider, and they make what appears to be lots of crazy loud jet propulsion noises when landing on runways, just like regular jets do when they're landing. Commander Charlie, oh Bob flaring up the shuttle's nose for landing and so you can see the main gear of in place. And since we're talking about jet propulsion, Let's go back to the moon for a moment, because some have pointed out how there's no crater underneath the lunar module landing. The jet propulsion would have likely created a crater, or at least some type of big marking, from its landing. There isn't any dust anywhere though, not even on the legs or feet of the module. I would think that some kind of dust or rocks should have been blown around from the lunar module landing on the moon. Keep in mind that the module had a 10,000 pound thrust engine, except it seems to have left no disturbance underneath it. 
Also, Neil Armstrong is sitting on top of that engine when it's initially landing on the moon, but he's heard clear as day when they're landing. 60 seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Straight shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward. Just... Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. There just seems to be so many questionable circumstances involving NASA. And yeah, this next one, I'm talking about the Space Shuttle Challenger of 1986 that exploded soon after takeoff. And please know that I'm taking this one carefully but seriously, because this one involves life and death. I just believe there are enough intriguing questions about the crew members on that exploding ship to touch on it here. Because six of the seven crew members are considered alive by many people today. Because there are six people living in the United States who closely resemble six original crew members from Challenger. The Challenger's commander was Francis Richard Scobie. Today there's a Richard Scobie who is CEO of a Chicago marketing company. These guys have some eerily similar features, like the same kind of wide set eyes that both seem to be tilted in their corners. The pilot was Michael J. Smith, and there's another Michael J. Smith living today, a professor, and they seem to look the same. Same smiles, it looks like the same teeth inside those smiles, both have blue eyes, and more. One of the mission specialists was Ronald McNair. It turns out that he has a brother named Carl, who's living today, and they look like they could be twin brothers. Another mission specialist was Ellison Onizuka. He also has a lookalike brother still alive today, and his brother's name is Claude. Another mission specialist was Judith Resnick, and there's a Yale law professor with similar features and identical name living today. And then there was the teacher, Sharon Krista McAuliffe. Well, there is a Syracuse professor named Sharon A. McAuliffe who looks a lot like the original crew member with the same first name and last name. Again, I do not take sharing this information lightly because it is a serious thing when you question if people may have really died. So I don't know about this for sure. I just know that the odds seem pretty crazy that six of the seven crew members have people living today with appropriately similar ages, nearly identical names, and strikingly similar features. And what about the fact that we're now planning to send humans to Mars and we want to colonize it? So forget about inhabiting the moon, which would be way easier because it's way closer and we've already put people on the moon, but instead let's go inhabit Mars, which is much further away and way harder to get to. So everything I've shared so far, to me it's really bizarre and odd. Much of it doesn't add up, if you ask me, but still, many of you will find explanations. There's a lot of info out there, but based on what my eyes have seen, based on using my own personal logic, even if I wanted to eliminate half of the things I just showed you as untrue, I simply can't explain away the other half as untrue because there is too much that just doesn't make sense in my head. But after looking over all of the information and evidence surrounding our explorations into outer space, the moon landings, and what science teaches me about it all, based on what I can actually observe and prove myself, I'm now at the point where I don't believe we ever went to the moon. I don't believe we've gone to outer space in the way that they tell us. I don't believe an international space station is orbiting the Earth. I don't believe it's possible. And there are many more extremely compelling reasons why I believe this, beyond the limited information that I've presented so far here. Of course, I promise to show you much more here, but I want to pause before moving on, because this information may be new to you, and that can make it hard to believe or even consider. You may be laughing at me right now, or wondering when Dave lost his mind and went full conspiracy theorist. I used to think that it was crazy before I started researching all of this. But what if it was possible? What if what you've been told was not the truth? Or maybe it was full of half-truths? Would it be the first time that someone lied to you? Would it be the first time that your government lied to you? 
It's easy for me to say that, especially when you may be thinking the opposite. But no matter what, I'm the one making these claims, so I need to present more information to show how all of the pieces could fit. So please just stay with me here because we barely touched the first layer of how odd and bizarre things may really be. Okay, Earth is what we're going to get into right now. We're going to focus on the place that you and I both live and exist. First off, what does the Bible say about Earth? Let's look at the first book of the Bible and see how the story of creation begins. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. So that said earth came into existence on the first day of creation, except the God of the Bible withheld the creation of the sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day, which is revealed inside Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. So the way that I read that is that earth is unique and it holds center stage inside God's creation. But whether you are a Christian or not, isn't it at least possible that earth could be the center and heart of everything? But whether you believe that earth is the heart or not, it turns out that it's really hard to get good photos of earth. And obviously, we have to go to outer space to get photos of earth itself. This is an article at the White House, a new blue marble, July 20th, 2015, NASA releases its new blue marble photo, first such photo since 1972. No one on this planet had ever seen a whole picture of the Earth until 1972. And you can see it's also at medium, and that's where I'm going to go to now to look at that because it has uh, a cleaner layout. You can see it's the same deal by Scott Kelly, NASA astronaut. No one on this planet had ever seen a whole picture of the Earth until 1972. Then you get the blue marble. This is a photo of it. It was the first full photo of Earth taken on December 7th, 1972. And that was the Apollo 17 spacecraft that took that. You got another photo here. Looks a little different. Okay, you got another image. Another image. So why is the blue marble a bigger deal than these? Turns out, it's quite tricky to take a good photo of the entire Earth. The planet is big, and there's a lot of lighting issues. As a result of these challenges, NASA, NOAA, and other science agencies most often rely on composite images to depict our planet. These images stitch together multiple high-resolution snapshots taken by satellites already in orbit to produce one seamless portrait of the Earth. And that's what the three photos above are, composite images produced by NASA over the past 15 years, released respectively in 2002, 2007, and 2012. Composite imaging is an extremely useful tool for helping people understand the Earth, like this black marble, which by stitching together multiple views of the planet shows a full global view of the Earth's city lights. That's why today I am excited to see that NASA has released its new blue marble, the first of many more to come later this year. The blue marble is the first fully illuminated snapshot of the Earth captured by the Discover satellite. It looks like it's a joint NASA, NOAA, and U.S. Air Force mission. And there's a guy who's famous for doing these composite images and manipulating data and putting it all together. And this is the guy right here. This is from NASA's website. It's an interview. Data visualizer and designer Robert Simmon. And they ask him, what do you do? And what is most interesting about your role here at Goddard? How do you help support Goddard's mission? And he says, my role is to make imagery from Earth Sciences data. I turn data into pictures. I look for new interesting events that NASA satellites have seen or that are hidden in the latest data to find anything interesting that shows off NASA's unique capabilities. Finding things is the fun part. I rely on engineers and scientists to produce the data. Okay, they ask him, what is the coolest thing you've ever done as part of your job at Goddard? And he says, the last time anyone took a photograph from above low Earth orbit that showed an entire hemisphere 
one side of a globe, was in 1972 during Apollo 17. He also says by 2002, we finally had enough data to make a snapshot of the entire Earth. So we did. The hard part was creating a flat map of the Earth's surface with four months of satellite data. Rito Stockley, now at the Swiss Federal Office of Meteorology and Climatology, did much of this work. Then we wrapped the flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface, clouds, and oceans to match people's expectations of how Earth looks from space. That became the famous blue marble. Okay, I know I already touched on this earlier, but I just keep wondering. Why doesn't NASA just deploy a rover to the moon, equipped with a camera at least comparable to my Nikon P900? Then they would have it on the moon's surface all the time. Because they could take continuous images of the entire Earth throughout the different seasons and months. They could zoom in on continents and islands, and maybe even more, like I do of the moon from here on Earth. Wouldn't you get good and accurate images with that approach? Wouldn't that make sense? But instead, they have a data visualizer slash designer who compiles all of the different data, and then that data gets stitched together by that person. But let's just step back again, and I'd like to review the Science 101, some of the basics surrounding the Earth, the Sun, and the Solar System. I'm talking about the basic info that we're all taught about Earth, the Sun, and the Solar System, and how they all move and work. First, the Earth rotates eastward around an invisible line known as its axis. And I've actually got some video of the Earth spinning provided by NASA. This is an official video by NASA of the Earth spinning. It was captured over a 25-hour period. It is really, really hard to see any of the continents in this video. I guess it was just too cloudy for those 25 hours. Okay, now I'm looking at life science. How fast does Earth move? As passengers on Earth, we are all carried around the sun at a mean velocity of 66,600 miles per hour. Add that dizzying notion to the fact that we are spinning at the equator at a 1,000 miles per hour clip, an action that caused the planet to bulge outward. Of course, these velocities are relative to the sun and to the poles, respectively. Okay, how fast is Earth moving? Let's look at that again. As an Earthling, it's easy to believe that we're standing still. After all, we don't feel any movement in our surroundings. But when you look at the sky, you see evidence that we are moving. Okay, how fast are we spinning? I just went through this. But it's interesting to see another source. And it talks about, depending on where you're located, right? Sun and galaxy move too. To blow your mind even more, the sun has an orbit of its own in the Milky Way. The sun is about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy, and the Milky Way is thought to be about 100,000 light years across. We are thought to be about halfway out from the center, according to Stanford University. The sun and the solar system appear to be moving at 200 kilometers per second, or at an average speed of 500, basically over 500,000 miles per hour. The Milky Way, too, moves in space relative to the other galaxies. In about 4 billion years, the Milky Way will collide with its nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. Everything in the universe is therefore in motion. Now let's go back to the Life Science article, How Fast Does Earth Move? Let's touch on the velocities and why we don't feel them. The reason we don't feel the rush is the same we aren't pinned to our seats while in an airplane moving at a constant speed. Velocity can only be measured with reference to another object moving at a different velocity, and we cannot feel velocity while in a constant frame of reference. This is why it might be news to you that our entire solar system is whizzing around the center of our galaxy at a fairly inconceivable, well, it's over 500,000 miles per hour. The galaxy is also moving with respect to other galaxies in the universe. And for all we know, the whole universe is moving, but now we're getting into great unknowns. Okay, so I just went over a lot of numbers, but it's all basic stuff. But that's pretty fast, right? I do think that it's kind of odd that we don't feel any of that spinning or rotation. I think these speeds are mind-blowing when you try and wrap your head around them or even imagine them. 
Here's a snapshot of someone's visual representation of what the solar system is doing according to the science and the speeds that I just shared. I think it's pretty wild when you just stop and look at this and think about it because we're just flying through space. We're just a big rock moving around with other big objects. I do find it interesting that we're taught all of this as fact, except there are a lot of great unknowns. And all we have are primarily CGI videos and composite images to look at and review. And if you aren't picking up what I'm putting down, then let me be really blunt here. I don't believe this visual representation is accurate. I believe something else could be true. And it's all based on the foundation that we never went to the moon. It's all based on the belief that we have not explored outer space. Because I do not think outer space exists as we've been taught. As a result, I believe something else when it comes to Earth, this place that we live on. And now it's time for me to share what I believe. It's something that may compel you to give me a hat made out of tinfoil. This may also compel you to laugh at me again. Maybe even more than when I shared my belief that we've never been to the moon. My statement may compel you to shut off this video right now, but please, I am asking you to just keep watching until the end of it. And yes, I recognize that this is going to sound very out there when you hear me say it. You're going to ask a lot of questions immediately. You're going to wonder what my claim would look like if it was true or even possible. But if you know me, you know that I am an over-researcher. You know that I'm the kind of guy who needs to understand how all of the pieces fit. So please, just know that I will begin to help make sense of it all and share lots of information immediately after I make my statement, or better yet, after I pose my question. Okay, here is my question. What if the Earth was flat? No, I am not kidding. Most people imagine something like this when they hear flat Earth. But my research shows it's nothing like this here because there's no edge that people can fall off. It doesn't really look different than anywhere you've ever visited on the earth. Again, I know this is an out there statement, but I promise I will provide detailed information on how this could work and what it could look like. I'll also share a map with a full breakdown. But before I go there, I need to go over some really important reasons why the spinning globe earth model that we've been taught has issues. It may be stuff that you've questioned before, and it probably includes stuff you haven't considered. Yes, we're looking at this again. For all of my fellow Christians, just think about this visual representation in regards to the story of creation. And consider how just moments ago I shared Genesis 1, and how Earth came into existence on the first day of creation. I mentioned how the God of the Bible withheld the creation of the sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. So, if Yahweh created the sun on the fourth day, then what was the earth rotating around for three days prior? Well, maybe earth is special, and like I mentioned moments ago, it holds center stage in God's creation. And maybe earth is not moving or rotating around the sun. Now let's keep this visual representation of the solar system in mind as I share some more important information, and it's related to the sky and what we can actually observe. So again, we know that there is a North Pole star. It's called Polaris, Alpha Ursae Minoris. Remember, this is what Polaris actually looks like. And remember, it doesn't move across the sky. It just stays there. And all of the stars in the Northern Hemisphere rotate counterclockwise around this star. But remember that the Earth rotates on its axis. And its axis runs from the North Pole star, Polaris, all the way down to the South Pole star, also known as Polaris Australis or Sigma Octanus. But I'm not sure many people think about these North and South Pole stars and how they work in relation to the Earth. Because just like the stars and planets rotate counterclockwise around the North Pole star in the Northern Hemisphere, the stars and all the planets actually rotate clockwise around the South Pole star in the Southern Hemisphere. These are long exposure shots that were taken by YouTuber Kofu72, and he did it by having a photo taken every 30 seconds, and it took an hour and a half of recorded shots to create just 10 seconds of Southern Star Trail video. So we have stars and planets rotating counterclockwise around the North Pole star, and we also have stars and planets rotating clockwise around the South Pole star. Except Earth and our solar system is supposed to be flying through space like this. 
but the North Pole star never moves above the Earth, and all the stars rotate around it. And the South Pole star stays in place below the Earth, and all the stars rotate around it the opposite direction down there. That's what the North and Southern star trails show us, and that's what we can actually observe when standing on Earth. So this makes me wonder, why do the stars that we can see in the Northern and Southern hemispheres stay aligned with the Earth as it spins? Why does everything in the sky, outside of the sun, moon, and wandering stars, why does everything else stay fixed on us and rotate around us from two very specific points on Earth? Well, I believe it's because we're special and we're the heart of everything. Straight up, I believe we've been told many untruths. And very shortly, I'm going to show you how I believe all of this could actually work. Because isn't it strange that you feel none, I mean none, of the Earth's rotation? That's anywhere from 700 to over 1,000 miles per hour. Those are ridiculous speeds and you feel nothing. Or what about the other speeds that are allegedly happening right now? Like the Earth rotating around the Sun or the solar system speeding at over 500,000 miles per hour. As humans, we can perceive movement. Our senses tell us when it's happening, even when we're in a car speeding down the highway, or when we're in an airplane, not just during takeoff and landing. Yeah, we get used to moving inside these objects, but we still know we're moving inside them, and we're moving at speeds a fraction of the Earth's rotation, except we don't feel any of the Earth's rotation. We don't feel the Earth orbiting the Sun. We don't feel any speed. We don't feel any movement of the solar system itself. This is important, and many people just brush it off. You may be doing that right now. Because again, we're told that we can't feel it because we're moving with the spinning Earth. We're told we're used to it. Yet our senses can and should be trusted. And if we're honest with them, they'll tell us that we're not moving at all. I believe it's that simple. But it's really hard to believe because it's not what we've been told since birth. But what about before birth? What do books that have been around for thousands of years say about all of this? Well, did you know that the scriptures consistently speak of an immovable, established earth? There are a lot of verses that are pretty explicit about this. So let's take a look at some of those verses right now. First, let's look at the beginning of Job 38. This is where Yahweh confronts Job about the way that Job was questioning Yahweh. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of Elohim shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors, when it brake forth, as it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors? and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the dayspring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. So Yahweh speaks of foundations, and the foundations of the earth being fastened, and a cornerstone being laid. He speaks of the ends of the earth. Yahweh, the God of the scriptures, basically says to Job, who are you to question how anything on earth works when you weren't even there when I created this place? I gotta say that this feels very similar to today because it seems like everywhere I look, I see mankind giving explanations about how earth works and how the solar system works, along with how everything works that actually came into existence around us. And those theories are basically presented as facts. So I think these verses from Job should be deeply considered as I continue, because I'm going to read a few more verses that speak of the earth being fixed and seemingly flat. This is First Chronicles 1630. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. 
This is Psalms 93.1. Yahweh reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. Yahweh is clothed with strength. Whereeth he hath girded himself, the world also is established, that it cannot be moved. This is Psalms 96.10. Say among the heathen that Yahweh reigneth. The world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. This is Psalms 104.5. Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever? This is Psalms 19 verses 4 through 6. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 5-6. through six. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about until the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. This is 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's, and he hath set the world upon them. Okay, this is Proverbs chapter 8. Verses 28 and 29. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the foundations of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. And this is Isaiah chapter 48, verse 13. My hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. So it seems like the scriptures keep saying that the earth is established, it has foundations, it is on pillars, and also that it's the sun going up and down on his circuits that he created. But as I keep emphasizing, we're taught that the earth is constantly moving, spinning around, and that the earth is flying through space, and it's orbiting the sun, and that the universe is constantly expanding. But the Bible says the earth does not move from its pillars and foundation. I cannot find it anywhere in the scriptures where it says that the earth is round or spinning or moving. However, there is one specific verse that most people point to when using the scriptures to try and support a ball earth in outer space. It's Job 26.7. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Okay, so people use that to support that the earth is it's in outer space. But it doesn't speak anything about the earth spinning or moving or anything like that. Everything else in the scriptures say that it is firm, fixed, immovable, it has foundations, it has pillars. So I don't think it's a strong argument here. Plus, if you look at the book of Enoch, you will see scriptures that actually complement this area right here in Job. Because Enoch comments about how he was shown beyond and above the heavens. And he comments that there is nothing above or below. So I look at all of this and I think, if you believe that the scriptures are the holy inspired words of our creator, then I find it confusing for people to believe that our creator would have had Job document something that contradicts so many other verses. So based on everything that I can find and research inside the scriptures, an established and immovable earth seems to be biblical truth. Also, my research has shown me that from the very beginning, ultra-Orthodox Christians believed this as well. They seem to have been flat earthers, because my research shows that the flat earth implications of the Bible were rediscovered and popularized by English-speaking Christians in the mid-19th century. And then their conclusions were dramatically confirmed by the rediscovery of Enoch, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I'll touch on shortly. But even if the earth was round and spinning through space, does it really make sense for our Creator to leave out and omit this critical information? I don't think He would do that. And it appears, based on everything that I've read inside the scriptures, that He told us what the truth really is here. 
but we accept the glow earth model the planets the stars the solar system and outer space in general because we're taught it as truth from childhood to adulthood it's reinforced over and over again but as you can see here the current popular belief of the earth being a ball flying through space is only about 500 years old it's relatively new compared to the existence of this earth but maybe you're thinking that people before this period of time had no idea how earth worked maybe you think that they were clueless because they couldn't explore earth or outer space like we allegedly do today well i don't believe that people were ignorant about how this earth worked or how it was created because i believe they've been told by yahweh our creator because there's documentation dating back over 2000 years I'm referring to the Dead Sea Scrolls that I mentioned a moment ago. These Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 when 11 caves were discovered near the Dead Sea. And these 11 caves ended up containing nearly 1100 ancient documents which have been dated to as early as 3rd century BC before Christ. And these scrolls included fragments from every Old Testament book except for the book of Esther. One of the most common books was Psalms. And there were also some apocryphal books, including the Book of Enoch. My point is that these scrolls, over 2,000-year-old documents and scriptures, when they're compared to the verses that we find in the Bible today, they're congruent, and they speak to the exact same thing. But let's step outside of the scriptures for a moment, because I believe that I need to also review some simple concepts when considering how the earth could be flat and not a spinning ball. So let's once again look at stuff that we can actually observe. And this first thing is pretty straightforward. It has to do with water. Because water, it always finds its level. Yes, water always finds its level. And doesn't water always flow downhill because that water is seeking its level? Do you believe these simple concepts are true? Do you believe that water always finds its level? And that water runs downhill? I believe they're true because I observe them happening all the time. So what about the miles and miles of ocean reaching from one continent to another? How does that water not find its level? Okay, this is California on Google Earth. Now let's scroll all the way over to Japan. It's over 5,000 miles of ocean from California to Japan. That's a lot of water that has to have a lot of curve. Okay, so what you're looking at now is a crude mock-up that I created that is going to try and represent the California to Japan scenario with a curved ocean. And let's say you have someone standing on the beach in California. And then you have someone standing all the way over there on the other side of the globe in Japan. Let's zoom in on what the person in California would see. Right? They're looking around. They see nothing but a flat land. And if they were to use their water level, they would see it's flat. Everything's flat. And then if we looked at the other side with the person standing on Japan on the edge looking out into the Pacific Ocean, they could also take their water level and they would see that it's level. They would see that it looks nothing but flat when looking out. So you have these two people and they're looking out. They both think that they're at the top of this ball. So what's really happening throughout this ocean, throughout this body of water? Can you take a water level to everywhere and it's going to be level? Yeah, of course you know that you could. But what if this is not what's really happening? What if this is what's really happening? And the two people standing on both continents are actually just at water level as well. Wouldn't that be easier to comprehend and understand? Because water always finds its level. So how is it not doing that across the ocean? Because even the ocean needs to find its level. I think this concept of water finding its level is a really big deal. I'm going to ask you to please do not discount this. And when it comes to water always finding its level, I've actually got a couple friends who are doing a world record water level test. Their names are Ronnie Harris and Jason Laufenberg. They run their own YouTube channels, but also run a shared channel at Beyond Flat Earth. And while I don't agree with everything that they've ever shared, we do agree on a whole lot, especially the Earth being flat. And I'm grateful to them because they've helped me discover and research so much. So they're going to do a world record water level test which I'm fully supporting. It's going to be pretty simple with a total of three miles worth of hoses. Obviously, it's going to have some water, a surveyor, and a bit more. So just go to YouTube and search World Record Water Level Test to learn more about it or even support it. Now let's keep moving along because I want to talk about gravity. Because we're told that gravity is what makes much of this happen, right? 
and gravity must exist and it must be true for the ball earth to exist. So what do we know about gravity? Well, here's what one of the most popular leaders in science says about gravity. What is gravity? We have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> Wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking like what it is, I I, I don't know. So uh, to say what is it? I think Einstein in an Einsteinian answer, we would say gravity is the curvature of space and time. And that and objects will follow the curvature of space-time, and we we interpret that as a force of gravity. Hmm. That's probably the best answer I can give to a what is gravity question, okay. or why is there gravity. That's the best I can do there. I think that that's a good start. And uh, I can also say that Einstein noted that gra matter tells space how to curve. Space tells matter how to move. Okay, are you confused yet? Apparently, I need to be an astrophysicist to understand or attempt to explain gravity. But if you zoomed in on the Earth from outer space and looked at the edge of the Earth, then you could see some really interesting stuff. You would see people standing sideways or even upside down. You would see mountains with the water rushing in startling directions. Remember, NASA could have and could still show us these types of videos by having a camera like mine on the surface of the moon. They could easily zoom in on the side of the earth like I zoom in on the side of the moon. Then they could show mountains and more on their sides or even upside down. So yeah, I've tried to wrap my head around gravity. Maybe my brain is just too simple to try and understand it though. Especially when I picture it working the way it's supposed to work all around the earth. Because this is literally how it would look. Water flowing upside down. People standing upside down. Except we all picture ourselves upright on top of the ball earth. Everyone always imagines they're standing at the top of the ball, but not everyone can be standing at the top of the ball, right? And it turns out that there are other explanations surrounding gravity. So I'd like to show you some of that right now. All right, so this is a balloon filled with half helium and half air. It's not going anywhere. It's not going up or down. It is just floating. So gravity, it holds people, buildings, and these miles and miles of oceans that I mentioned earlier all of it gets held to the Earth's surface because of gravity. But it can't actually pull down this balloon that's filled with half helium and half air. And then what about this balloon that just floats off into the air? But then what about these balloons? They just go straight up as well. Gravity is not pulling on these. So it seems that gravity is not very consistent. These are a few more examples of things being dropped, obviously into water, and how they're reacting. And then this video continues to actually share how the buoyant force is the opposite of density and that it's density that causes objects to fall and not gravity pulling these objects down. Here are some more examples. But let's move beyond gravity for a moment, okay? Because I want to go back to the concept of water always finding its level. When I was going over this earlier, I basically said that there's no curvature on Earth. And I bet that that curvature is not something you have actually observed using your own eyes. But it's something that we're supposed to believe exists because we've all been told it's there. But how many people really think about this? So where can you see the curvature of the Earth? You should be able to detect the curvature of the Earth from an aeroplane at a cruising height of around 35,000 feet. But you'd need a fairly wide field of view, 60 degrees, and a virtually cloud-free horizon. So this is what you would see when rising in altitude. This video was actually recorded by people using balloons. And in some instances, they were looking for the curvature of the Earth. As you can see, there's no curvature. Except you can see because of the lens, sometimes it distorts the Earth and it makes it look like there's curvature. And again, that's just the lens. I'm gonna go over that in just a moment. But what is the math behind the curvature? This is the math that somebody did right here. And you can see here that it's a spherical trigonometry of a sphere with 4,000 mile radius. And you can see here from the center point to the surface of the Earth, it's supposed to be roughly 4,000 miles because that's the radius. You can see the math here and how it's working. Okay, so you can see at one mile, 
it's, it's not even close to a mile. It's less than a foot drop in the curvature. But then if you skip down to 10 miles, um, you're looking out 10 miles, uh, based on where you're standing, it's gonna be about 66 feet. It's still not a mile, but skip all the way down to 100 miles. It's about one and a quarter miles is what the actual drop would be, the curve would be. And you're looking at over 6,000 feet at that point. And then if you were to actually go to 1,000 miles, let's say you were looking 1,000 miles out from where you're standing, it's gonna be a 128 mile curve and drop to that point out there from where you're standing 1,000 miles. And you can see it goes further and further. At 2,000 miles, you're looking at over a 500 mile drop based on where you're looking. Really quickly, what is a fisheye lens? A fisheye lens is an ultra wide angle lens that produces strong visual distortion intended to create a wide panoramic or hemispherical image. And it talks a little bit more about that. You can see what it looks like right here. And I gotta tell you that I was recently on a 14 hour flight where they used the fisheye lens to show the exterior to passengers through our television screens as we made our trip across the earth. That fisheye lens made the outside surface look curved when we were in the air, except when we took off and landed, the same distorted curved proportions remained. And speaking of airplanes flying great distances, do planes constantly have to steer downward toward the earth? Remember, they're covering a lot of distance and a lot of curvature in a very short amount of time. Now let's go back to the same mock-up that I created, the one that I used before. And let's say that an airplane is flying from one continent to the other. Let's use Japan and California again, because you're gonna have an airplane right here, and it's gonna to have to take off on what it thinks is a flat surface, and it's gonna to have to cover the ocean, and it's gonna have a certain trajectory, and it's gonna go that distance for a certain amount of time. But what it really needs to do is curve around the Earth. So that means that that airplane, every so often, should actually be pointing down and changing its trajectory. It's gonna to have to keep doing that over and over and over again. But wouldn't it make more sense if it was actually just flying straight across a level ocean? Because doesn't water always find its level? And what happens when planes need to land? Let's look at another quick mock-up because keep in mind that the Earth is rotating as airplanes are flying. And so what you got here is the Pacific Ocean in California. You've got your north, east, west, and south. Remember that the Earth rotates eastward, right? It's gonna be moving this direction. But let's say we actually put an airstrip on California north to south. And let's say that we had an airplane that was gonna land in the direction of north. As the airplane is landing and moving across the earth, wouldn't the earth's surface be moving eastward? So wouldn't airplanes have to take into account this movement? Wouldn't that be a challenge for them to land? Of course, I am aware that I guess some people say that we are in an enclosed atmosphere. So the atmosphere itself is moving with the Earth. But I still think about these kind of things and it doesn't make complete sense. Something else that doesn't make sense when it comes to airplanes flying is a gyroscope. First, how does a gyroscope actually work? And what does it do? And how does it work in planes? Let's take a look at a quick video. This is a gyroscope. It consists of a metal wheel mounted on an axle. The wheel and axle spin freely, secured in a metal frame. This simple device can behave in the most unexpected ways. The components of this simple mechanism are obvious, and it doesn't seem to have any special capabilities. Try to stand it on end and it falls over. Try to suspend it like this and it drops. Apparently it can't defy gravity but spin the wheel and all that changes. A string provides a simple method to spin the wheel. The first thing I notice about the spinning gyroscope is that it resists attempts to change its position. A resistive force appears when I attempt to tilt or rotate the gyro. Now when I stand it on the tabletop, it stays vertical. The spinning wheel is creating a force that holds the gyroscope upright. When the wheel stops, the force disappears and the gyroscope falls. Incredibly, this force will support the gyroscope like this. It appears to be levitating. A spinning gyroscope will balance on a string. You can even lift the gyroscope with a string looped around one end.
This interesting behavior is difficult to explain. Physicists have determined that a rotating wheel has angular momentum, similar to the momentum that a stone flying through the air has. To change the direction of the stone requires a force. Similarly, changing the orientation of the rotating wheel requires force. The spinning wheel prefers to stay oriented as it is, and it resists any attempt to change that orientation. The fact that gyroscopes will maintain a particular orientation in space is very useful. In modern aircraft, an inertial guidance system uses spinning gyroscopes to monitor and control the orientation of the aircraft. The gyroscope is suspended in a special cage that allows it to maintain its orientation independent of the aircraft's position. If the aircraft rolls, electric sensors and contacts connected to the gyro send information to the pilot about the aircraft's orientation. Now let's go back to my previous example of flying from Japan to California and consider a couple other items. Remember, it's over 5,000 miles of ocean from Japan to California. And the curvature math says that with right at 4,000 miles of distance, there will be right at 4,000 miles of curvature from your starting point to the ending point, assuming that you're actually traveling 4,000 miles of distance. So with that in mind, let's look at my previous mock-up. Here's the airplane taking off, and remember, the Pacific Ocean must be curved based on what we're taught. So the airplane flying across these thousands of miles would need to keep pointing down due to the 5,000 miles of distance and thousands of miles of curvature below. So how can a gyroscope be properly calibrated on a globe Earth when there are thousands of miles of curvature? How does it work when the Earth is always spinning? Is the gyroscope constantly correcting itself? Is it constantly resetting itself? Is it constantly stopping and recalibrating itself? It just doesn't make sense to me when I look at everything and how it works. And here's something interesting that I found at NASA's website. It's a NASA reference publication from the late 1980s about the derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model. Let's go through this. There's a lot of math, but toward the end on page 30, the first sentence in the concluding remarks say, this report derives and defines a set of linearized system matrices of a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. I got to ask, why would this exist if we're supposed to be on a spinning ball? NASA had already been to the moon several times and explored outer space in many ways by the 1980s. So why would they need documentation talking anything about a stationary atmosphere and a flat, non-rotating Earth? I just don't get it. And of course, I understand that this does not prove anything by itself. There are just so many things out there that when combined, they create a convergence of strangeness that makes your head spin like the earth is supposed to be spinning. So yeah, all of this stuff is strange because whenever I look out a car, all I see is a flat horizon. And whenever I look out a plane's window, all I see is a flat horizon. Everywhere I look, I see a straight or flat horizon. The earth appears flat to me based on everything that I can actually observe. And just look at these Bolivian salt flats, which are the world's largest salt flat at over 4,000 square miles. It has an extraordinary flatness with the average elevation variations within about three feet over the entire area. And it seems as if stuff isn't really dropping down at a curve out of our view of distance either. Because to me it seems like we can only see a few miles out. And then things start to get hazy, unless you go higher. Because when you go higher in altitude, that's when your circle of view increases, and you can see further out. Except based on the Earth's curvature using this math, the land should start dropping from wherever you're standing on a ball Earth. Even if you're looking 40 miles out, there should be at least a thousand foot decline due to the curvature. Even if it's a small gradual decline for only a mile. No matter what, the math says that the Earth must curve downward, and that means that things farthest out should be dropping or slanting off toward the distance, but videos like these and so many more out there contradict what I'm told is supposed to happen on a ball Earth when I'm observing the distance and objects at the edge of my circle of view. Again, the horizon always rises to the eye level of the observer based on how high or low you are, but as you go further up in the air, you can always see further out into the distance. 
Okay, I've got just one more quick thing to show you before we move on to the next part. I'd like to ask if you've ever thought about 3D modeling, or video games, or virtual reality programs in general. Because whenever someone is showing you and portraying Earth's reality inside 3D modeling, or video games, or virtual reality, don't they always use flat surfaces and straight and flat horizons? Yes, they use a flat plane environment when presenting you with a simulated Earth. Everything is presented as flat. They don't show curvature or simulate a constantly moving Earth. This is something else to think about and consider. I know that I'm proposing some really challenging views here, so before I continue, I want to pause. Because right now, your mindset probably remains in one of two gears. The first could be that you're still somewhat open to the possibilities of what I've shown you up to this point, but you have a lot of questions about everything, or maybe at least most of it. The second gear could be that you're still disappointed in what I'm sharing, and maybe you're rejecting and discounting most or all of what I'm saying, and maybe you're thinking that I may have truly lost my mind, and those thoughts confuse or upset you, because you're sitting there wondering how I could be open to believing these things. Here's what I'd say to both camps either way. Believe me, I know what I'm sharing here is strange, to say the least. Again, this was not easy for me to consider. That's why I've done my own research into everything that I've shown you so far. That's what led me to research the even stranger things that I'm going to show next. But no matter what, whether you're questioning everything or open to anything, I have a feeling that you want me to show you what a flat earth could actually look like and what it would take for it to actually work, right? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to focus on next. And this next part may end up being the hardest thing for you to consider process, or accept. So at this point, you know the challenges that I see in this model of the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and the Solar System. And based on what people can actually observe, and based on my faith in the scriptures, I don't believe that we're flying through space, or that we're just a speck of dust in an ever-expanding universe. And I've offered examples and reasons why I believe so much of what we've been taught just doesn't seem to make complete sense. Except I've challenged you to consider that the Earth could be flat. And because of that, I've promised to show you how a flat Earth could actually work and what it could look like. And I'm going to do that here inside this part. But in order to show you that viewpoint, I need to reveal something else regarding this unique place that we all live. Because this something else is a foundational element for a flat Earth to be possible. And that means that things are going to stay strange. Because I'm going to tell you something that you may find even more out there than a fake moon landing. This may be interpreted as more out there than the Earth being flat. Because here's where I tell you that based on everything I've researched and everything I've discovered so far, and everything that I've been able to observe up until this point, it appears that we are living in a simulation. Uh, how do you think will virtual reality tie in the future of transportation which you are working on? Thank you. Well, maybe we're in a simulation right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, so, following the other speakers, I have a change of pace, a little bit of a fun talk. And what I'm going to try and do is convince you you're a simulation and that physics can prove it. Okay, so instead of a usual uplifting talk, this is a different kind of talk. Okay, so there's one thing you know for certain, that is that you exist as a flesh and blood human being. My goal is to convince you otherwise. Okay, so logic is not gonna be enough. You guys are gonna be simulation deniers. Right? I mean, there's just no way around it. So my actual goal will be to actually create a sliver of doubt in your minds so that you actually think about this and what it might mean. So I know this is a lot to throw at you. I've also got to immediately share that I do not agree with these men in regards to their definitions of a simulation, but it appears that their positions seem to contain some truth. Because based on what I can determine as of now, I believe we are living inside a simulation. But I don't believe humans are inside some simulation being run on some supercomputer. For the record, I believe the God of the Bible created everything around us. But please know that I'm going to do more than just say I believe we're in a simulation. I'm going to actually show you what I believe to be unique visual evidence that supports this claim. 
because there are visual wonders everywhere. They're mostly overlooked. But it does seem that this place can show us many things if we just look up and all around. First, these are crepuscular rays. Can you see them between the bed of clouds and the ocean? Can you see the rays shining down at some really unique angles? Well, Wikipedia says that crepuscular rays are rays of sunlight that appear to radiate from the point in the sky where the sun is located. This is pretty amazing, right? It's kind of crazy too, right? Dave from Enslaved by Media recorded this, and I'm going to also intertwine a lot of other footage. But can anyone tell me how a sun that's supposed to be 93 million miles away can create rays of light that go through the clouds at these angles? Do you know how close the sun would need to be to create these angles that we're looking at here? I bet you'll find lots of complicated scientific explanations out there about atmospheric optics and more. But those answers don't make much sense when you think about what we've been taught with the way light moves and travels, and what it would take to create these angles. And please know that these crepuscular rays happen to people all over the Earth, at different longitudes and latitudes, different seasons, different times of the day when the sun is around them. Now let's stay in the clouds for a bit, because my buddy Mike from Flat Earth Photography, he recorded this. Look at these shadows. The sun looks like it's actually in these clouds. This is what I call a visual wonder. Come on, look at this. It just doesn't make sense for the sun to be 93 million miles away when we can constantly observe and record these types of sun and shadow interactions. Again, it looks like the sun is local to the observer. Like it's local to all of us. So let's keep reviewing the sun's relationship with clouds. And this one may be hard for you to process as well. Because what does this look like to you? Liz Dexick recorded this video, and you have no idea how many times I've looked at videos like this and tried to make sense of it. Because it's video like this that got me to get out there and personally record this kind of stuff and witness it myself. Because it appears the clouds are behind the sun. Your mind right now may be trying to tell yourself things about this video. You may be trying to explain this away in this very moment. Like the clouds are too thin or the clouds simply aren't coming through on the camera due to the sun being too bright. But just look at this and pretend what I'm saying was possible for just a moment. What does this actually look like to you? Does it look like the clouds are behind the sun? And if you're not sure, let's take another look. Let's see what happens when we add a negative filter and other filters. Do you see the cloud layers? Do you see the depth of the clouds and how the camera processed the sun as in between the clouds, with some in front and some behind in the back? And there are so many videos out there showing this phenomenon. So many people have recorded this from all over the earth. There's more evidence out there if you want to find it. Now I'd like to show you more strangeness that indicates we're living in a simulation. These are the shadows of trees during a solar eclipse. How are these kinds of shadows possible? Would you call these normal? Can you tell me how these shadows work? Again, maybe you'll find some scientific explanation for this out there. But I challenge someone to recreate these types of shadows through trees when an eclipse is not happening. And then there are also shadow bands that occur during solar eclipses. These are also strange and also interesting. And they've been captured all over the Earth during solar eclipses as well. Straight up, it certainly seems that solar eclipses are special, unique events. But how does a solar eclipse really work? Because we all know that the sun and moon are always moving across the sky, right? So just stop for a moment and think about how the sun and the moon need to basically stand still and stop in unison for a solar eclipse to work. Or they need to be moving at the exact same speed for quite some time because some total solar eclipses have lasted up to six and seven minutes. And with that in mind, I've recorded hours upon hours of the moon, the sun, and the stars, and they all travel across the frame of my camera really quickly. Either way, being in the path of totality is a special event in itself. 
Here's what I actually witnessed during the Great American Eclipse in August of 2017. I personally recorded this video in the state of Oregon. No filter, nothing but my Nikon P900. Holy moly, look at that. Frogs, bats, birds, crickets, they all thought it was nighttime, and they all started doing their nighttime business. The temperature also dropped, and stars came out. This was a really crazy moment, something that's hard to fully explain to somebody else. It's the kind of moment that helped me see we could be living in a simulation. Now let's slow down for a moment to touch on what I mean when I use the word simulation. I found this online. It's an interesting approach because someone said, this is a neurological simulation. We're all gamers, souls inside of bodies. The body equals computer hardware and the soul equals the operating system slash software. Our experience is basically that as of a user or simmer. So that's an interesting point of view. But now I want to take a moment to speak to my fellow Christians because I'd like to look at the book of Genesis. Because if you think about what the scriptures really say about this place and how it was created, it shouldn't be that big of a leap when considering that we live in a simulation. Because on the first pages of the Bible inside Genesis chapter 1, it offers the story of creation. And that creation story immediately speaks of how we got here, the order of everything. And I believe it also indicates we're living in a simulation. Because it makes more sense to me when I look at it from a simulation point of view. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. 
and the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good, and Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, so that's day one of creation. It says the God of the Bible created the heaven and the earth. The sun and moon did not exist here on day one. The sun and moon weren't created and added until the fourth day of creation. So let's go to verse 14 and start reading. And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Okay, so that's day four of the creation story inside Genesis. If you're a Christian and believe the scriptures and believe his word is the truth, then I'm going to ask you to please consider that this clearly states that light and darkness, day and night, evening and morning, were created and existed before the two great lights, the sun and the moon. I believe these words are truth. Yes, there are parables and parabolic language inside the scriptures, but based on everything that I know, Genesis chapter 1 this portion is not intended as a parable. It is the creator's story of the order in which he put everything here inside this place we live and exist. And think about what else was said here inside Genesis. It's said that the sun and the moon were both great lights. The greater light is the sun and the lesser light is the moon. That means the sun's light is not reflecting off the moon. That means the moon is its own standalone light source. The moon is just the lesser light. Yeah, I know, these sound like bizarre claims that I'm making, especially when compared to what you and I have been taught and what's widely accepted. But I wouldn't be suggesting these alternative strange truths if I didn't think there was real merit in them. Now let's consider something else. Because if you're open to this created place not being a spinning ball, and you can come to grips with the possibility that the earth could be a flat plane, then all you have to do is look up to reach the possibility that you're living inside a simulation. Because when you look up, you will see that the sun, on any given day, during and near solar noon, is always above you personally. But no matter what, the sun is always within your circle of sight during daytime. But it's like that for everyone on Earth. So that means the sun doesn't seem to be a physical object hanging up there. I think it's something else. And I think that something else that I could actually wrap my head around is that the sun is local. So let's be really clear here. I'm saying the sun and the moon are traveling on the Creator's circuit, and the sun and moon are being personally rendered to you, the observer, because you are the center of your simulation. You are the avatar seeing your sun and moon. The sun and moon seem to be objects being rendered to each person inside the simulation which we all share and live in. I believe this is why we can all see crepuscular rays. I believe this is why we can all see the sun appearing inside of clouds. I believe this is why we can all see clouds behind the sun. And I believe that this is why we can also see clouds behind the moon. So as of now, I certainly do not think that the sun or the moon are round balls floating in space. And that's why I don't believe the moon is a physical object that we can actually reach by aircraft either. And when it comes to the stars, it seems the stars have been mapped across the entire sky of the Earth, and they cover all of the land that we can travel across inside this simulation, from the North Pole Star to the South Pole Star. And that's what I'm going to review next, the land that we live on, Earth, because it is finally time for me to show you a visual representation of how a flat Earth, the Sun, the Moon, the stars, and everything could actually look, at least based on everything I've researched so far. And do you remember when I shared earlier how there are many half-truths out there? Well, I need you to recognize that when you research the term flat earth, 
You'll find a lot of explanations, and the truth often ends up being buried among disinformation. So I want to first show you the popular flat earth model. It's a half truth. Half true in the sense that I believe it's true that the earth is flat, but it's untrue that this is what it really looks like. So the popular flat earth model, it uses an azimuthal equidistant projection, or what I'll call an AE map from here out. And this is a visual representation of the popular flat earth model using the AE map. Unfortunately, when I realized that the earth could be flat, this was the model that I found being promoted by nearly everyone. And this map says that there is only one pole star, and it's above the center of everything. And there's a dome over this enclosed environment that we live. It also says that Antarctica surrounds our oceans and continents. It basically says that Antarctica is an ice ring wall around the flat Earth. And the promoters of this AE map also say that the sun and moon are only about 3,000 miles away, and that they're both doing circles above us. But I've discovered that that's impossible. It can't be happening. Because the sunrise and sunset declinations prove circling suns and moons to be impossible especially in the southern hemisphere. Every single person on this earth who has a compass can verify this model is impossible due to the sunrise and sunsets. But I'll admit I fell for this popular flat earth model and I'm not proud of that. But it turns out there are some compelling reasons to fall for it. First, most people are looking for answers when they discover that the earth could be flat and they often accept the first model presented. So many people don't keep researching, and that means that many people don't test things about this AE map because they assume the person presenting it already did all of that legwork. So those people don't ever confirm simple things like the impossibility of the sunrise and sunset declinations on this AE map. Also, the promoters of this AE map often point to movies as evidence that it's true, because why else would it be in the background of so many movies? They also point out how the United Nations uses this AE map. And this is an interesting one because there's also something called the Antarctic Treaty System. This treaty includes 50 plus major nations and it prevents civilians like you and me from simply visiting and checking out Antarctica. Wikipedia says, The main objective of the Antarctic Treaty is to ensure in the interests of all humankind that Antarctica shall continue forever to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes and shall not become the scene or object of international discord. And the popular flat earth model promoters say that we're not allowed to visit Antarctica because it's really an outer ice ring that would expose the earth as flat. Obviously, I don't agree with that, and I don't really know why this treaty exists other than what I just shared from Wikipedia. But I know the popular flat earth model does not work. Because if their model was true, then we would have a 24-hour sun and a 24-hour moon. Yes, the sun and the moon would never actually set inside their model. Instead, what they claim is that the sun and moon are simply going further away from you, and it's perspective that makes them look like they're setting below a horizon. I'm sorry, but that's not what I've actually observed using my camera. Plus, there's like no video of a 24-hour sun or moon anywhere online. Yeah, you'll probably be able to find a couple videos trying to support that. Just be aware that they're all either out of focus or straight up doctored videos. And this is one of the newest models being promoted by some popular Flat Earth folks on YouTube. This model doesn't work for many of the same reasons, and it also no longer makes the Earth flat. I truly believe that most of the people at the popular Flat Earth channels promoting either of these Flat Earth models are purposefully spreading disinformation. Because if they just kept searching for the truth, then they would discover contradictions and major flaws in what they're promoting they would see very quickly that their models couldn't work with what we actually observe around us. And on top of that, I found that most of the popular Flat Earth model promoters, they have PayPal and Patreon accounts, and they seem to be on a mission to make money. Fortunately, there are some people who are really searching for the truth. Starting with these two guys that I mentioned earlier, Ronnie Harris and Jason Laufenberg. They're not asking for any money, and they're willing to be proven wrong. They want to be proven wrong if that's the case. And just like me, they just want to know the truth and share it with people. And these guys have studied countless maps, searching for an accurate map that could represent a flat Earth. They actually got a tip from something that Neil deGrasse Tyson said, something I already showed you earlier. So Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's, an, it's oblate. 
and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So they thought maybe the flat Earth could be oblate in some way. That's when they discovered the oblique Mercator projection. And cartographers seem to agree that it is the most accurate flat representation of Earth. But first, what's cartography all about? Okay, so we're here at the Canadian Cartographic Association. And it says that the International Cartographic Association defines cartography as the discipline dealing with the conception, production, dissemination, and study of maps. Cartography is also about representation, the map. This means that cartography is the whole process of mapping. Cartography is a complex and ever-changing field, but at the center of it is the map-making process. Viewed in the broadest sense, this process includes everything from the gathering, evaluation, and processing of source data through the intellectual and graphical design of the map to the drawing and reproduction of the final document. Once seen as the products of a relatively straightforward practical exercise, maps are now viewed as complex intellectual images offering a rich potential for scientific investigation. Cartography today has two essential characteristics. First of all, it is important. Maps perform a fundamental and indispensable role as one of the underpinnings of civilization. Few activities relating to the Earth's surface, whether land use planning, property ownership, weather forecasting, road construction, locational analysis, emergency response, forest management, mineral prospecting, navigation, the list is endless, would be practical without maps. Okay, now let's go to world maps online. You'll see this is a world satellite image map. It's the oblique Mercator projection that I just mentioned. And it says, this stunningly detailed satellite image map of the world detailed land cover data depicted in an oblique Mercator projection. The parameters of this map projection have been carefully chosen so that the inevitable distortion that occurs is relegated to the oceans and to the least populated and least recognizable land masses. And it goes on to say the result is a unique, visually interesting flat map of the world that exhibits nearly no distortion in the most familiar areas, even at the poles. Let's read that one more time. The result is a unique, visually interesting flat map of the world that exhibits nearly no distortion in the most familiar areas, even at the poles. And now I'm going to play some video where Jason and Ronnie they walk through a flat earth map and how it could actually work. When you look at this map, what looks different to me is Alaska and this part of Russia up here. Yeah, Russia too is crazy big. Over yeah, there. this island over here just seems, whoa, crazy. Yeah, it's huge. And um, yeah, the, you know, this, this string of islands. So we are told by this map manufacturer that what they've done with this map is everything they can to make the land masses the absolute most accurate size and all these things wise and that if there's distortions that they've pushed that out to the water um just a quick thing about maps if you were on a globe if you lived on a sphere it is true that there would be no flat two-dimensional map that would be accurate of the world. But if you're not on a globe and you're actually on a flat plane, that means that there is a flat map that is the true accurate map of the world. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was looking for. But the the criteria that I was looking for was a, a flat two dimensional map that when you wrapped it onto a sphere, like in a 3D modeling program, like Blender, like we've been using, that it would look like it was a globe. Because when you look at the angles of the sunrise and the sunset in the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere, when you study those and you, you realize what's going on, it appears by looking at those angles that we would be on a globe strictly by looking at the angles. Yeah. Even though that we don't see curvature anywhere. Okay. So 
So I was looking for a different kind of map, a flat map, but one that when it wraps up on a globe appears like it's a sphere. And, and that's what this map is. When you import this into a program like Blender and wrap it onto a sphere, you end up with something that looks just like the globe. These, these curved lines, the way they wrap out when you unwrap this in a 3D modeling program, these turn into, these are the lines of latitude. They wrap around and connect and touch each other. It looks like a globe. This is that mesh work. And I was talking about how when I was wrapping a map, an actual map, a flat two-dimensional map onto, um, onto spheres and blender. How, the way I was taught, you, you put the camera view in a certain position and uh, you got a different grid work than this. It, it was just a rectangular grid work, but I, I forgot to adjust the angle. And uh, when I went to do the UV unwrap, it created this mesh work. And you can see that it's, it's got these three points. Now, this is really a rectangle here because if you look at these edges, they fill in the gaps on the other side. And this right here fills in the gap on this side. Even with the mesh laid out like this, uh, you can see here how it wraps up like a globe. And the distortions here, we've got this blue area here, blue area here. Those are right here. So this becomes the international date line on either side right here. So if you were to travel across this, that would be a change of a day like we're familiar with on a globe. That's this right back here. And uh, you can also see that just by snapping this mesh work on, that what it does is here in Blender, it, it's perfect grid work. It comes together at, at like a true north here. Here's your vertical axes. But if you look to the side here, you can see that when you wrap this map up here, it tips it over so that uh, the north pole here sits at like a 23 and a half degree tilt to, to a, a, a vertical north here. So that to me is the reason why they tell us that we're at a 23 and a half degree tilt because mm -hmm. because the way it wraps up like that we're showing you this map in this in order for this map to work it has to be a simulation um we're not talking about the physical reality that we've all been taught when we're showing you this map because it's easy to debunk if you're still thinking in the terms of a physical reality it's this this edge along here that is really posing a huge problem for people um, when you're thinking about simulation because we can't imagine really what what happens here i try to um but as far as what makes sense like you're in hawaii so a flight from hawaii to japan um when you're flying like this and you cross this edge in a simulation it appears that you just come out back across over here and you finish your flight. The, um, the thing that happens is when you cross this line, you change days. So as soon as you go across that line, everybody over here thinks it's the next day. And if you go across the line back the other direction, everybody over here thinks it's the day before. Um, so that we've got that, the edge around here until we observe it better, we don't exactly know. But if you're looking at these, these lines here, the lines of longitude, as we're familiar with, that wrap into the North Pole, this would be a magnetic line. So if you're in Hawaii and you're following the magnetic north, according to this map, what would happen is you'd be going like this between these lines. You'd come up here, and I, I think if you look at any maps, if you look at north of Hawaii, you're gonna run into these islands here of, of Alaska and come up through this area. Keep, keep watching the regular maps that you're familiar with. You're gonna travel through this area and then you will come around to here, North Pole. And then from this point, your compass would, would flip and you'd be going other directions. If you, know, if you kept going through, North would be behind you. you. 
you kept following this line and you're coming down through Africa, this, this would be south the whole way, north would be on your back, but you would continue following this arced path out here around in the ocean. You know, if you didn't know, if you didn't know that the straight shot from uh, Cape Town to Antarctica was this way and you just kept following the compass, you would arc around like this, come back around into what we would call the South Pole. Now, one of the things that Darren was showing people as trying to get people all confused about the magnetics and magnetic declination is he was showing on how a map of Antarctica, how you can move from one place to another in Antarctica and all of a sudden your compass would be 180 degrees the other direction. And if you look at the way Antarctica is split here, this, this whole line right here, if you were to travel from, uh, from one point to the other, you can see how your, your compass would flip just, just like it would up here at the North Pole. And uh, he, he was showing along this edge how radically different the magnetics, the magnetic declination angles are. And uh, you can see based on these lines of longitude, if, if they're the magnetics, you can completely understand why it would be the, that case. So, you know, a person in, in this area right here for their compass to point north, um, they, they give you that magnetic declination map to give you that shortcut back up to the north so you didn't go swooping down through the ocean here. Um, so Antarctica on this map, the magnetic flipping of the poles that Jaron was showing is, is another proof that this would be the correct, correct map of this world. So while there's things that we can't prove about it yet, there are things that we can. And those are the things that we're, we're focused at looking at right now. This red line here is the equator. And so this is the east. And by following this path, this, this is all, all coherent with what we're familiar with. This is where with the equator you know, travels through um, Malaysia and through Africa and through uh, South America here. Um, Trop of, Tropic of Cancer. So that lines up, you know, coming across here just below the Baja Peninsula through central Mexico, North Pole right here. So here's the interesting thing on, on this map, because these lines right here wrapping, wrapping around like this up to the north. If this is the magnetics, when you're in Hawaii and your compass points north, and you were to just follow it north, what I'm speculating and would assume to be true and would like to have proven false if possible is that traveling north from Hawaii, if you follow my cursor here, you would actually make this sweeping motion if you just continually followed north until you got here. Okay. That this, these lines right here are the magnetic lines. So north would look like this motion right here and you would come through this part of Alaska right here and you would come through the north part right here and that you would come to this point, boom. And then from this point, everything would be south. And they would feed back to these points, which is actually really the same point just split in half. One's on this side and one's on this side. It appears that a point directly above this is is Polaris. Okay. And that that all all the people in the northern hemisphere that are looking towards Polaris mm -hmm. are looking towards you know a light in the sky centered over this. Yeah. But still uh, that's that's sort of like a physical look at this reality. Mm -hmm. I'm now really convinced that it's a simulation. So sometimes, sometimes you get caught talking in, in like physical reality terms, you know, like, because what we're seeing with the sunrise and the sunset is so close, like three to four miles, this, this is a simulation. So mm. sometimes you, 
It's boggling. Yeah, it is boggling. This is the international date line right here, this edge. So what happens when you cross the international date line? You, you change your clock ahead of day or back a day, depending on which yeah. way you're going, right? Uh-huh. So you cross that line and then you just keep on trucking and then you end up there. So it's, it's the day separator in the simulation. And everywhere on this map, the sun rises and sets due east to due west. And Jason Awake Souls has done an amazing job um, out there recording this with his compass and um, just stellar, stellar work. Um, so I guess what we'd like to show now is, so the stars, if this, we're looking from the north here, I, I think, can you see? Mm -hmm. So basically from the north, it takes a second for them to kick in here. Yeah, I can see a moment. Um, so oh, yeah, there we go. looking yeah. south from the north, the stars spin clockwise from yeah. from anywhere on the map, right? You, you uh -huh. Now when we're looking north from the south, uh, wh which way do you think the stars are going to go, Jay? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so that... it doesn't matter where you are, right? I, I think everyone can see this is south. This is north, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> east and west i just want to make it really clear and there's there's a celestial axis that goes through here and an equator that goes through here making a cross so there's four sections to this flat realm there's four corners it's all biblical and if you're looking to the east from anywhere on this map you will see the stars rising coming 90 degrees above you at their mid mid point meridian mm -hmm. always from anywhere on this map you'll see them rising from the equator from the east and then west they set everything sets to the west returns to heaven and gains its glory and then rises and hastens back to where it started and does this it again and that, is e, that is Enoch that you were quoting, correct? Uh, more ad lib. <laughs> but that's what he wrote and gave an account and said to tell everyone, all generations of the earth. And it was actually written, it was for a, a generation in the future. Yes, this is a lot to take in and try to process. But again, if we're living inside a simulation, then everything you just watched could actually work. Because what about the miracles performed by Yahawashai, the Christ? Don't his miracles make more sense if you approach them as if he performed them inside a simulation? Like the walking on water? Or like the transformation of water into wine? Or like the miracle of the five loaves and two fish? And what about miracles in general, like the ones you've heard about or experienced around you personally? Like a person being strong enough to lift a vehicle off of someone else? Or what about someone surviving a skydiving accident without even a broken bone? Or what about cancer going away from one test to the next? There are so many things that happen that just can't be explained away based on the rules that we've been taught. Because what we're looking at right now are actually dew drops. It's water recorded in somebody's backyard. These look a lot like the stars in the sky that I've personally recorded. And what about the clouds? Science says that clouds are a large collection of tiny droplets of water, or ice crystals. They also say clouds are a mixture of gas, liquids, and solids. But I've sat in a lot of window seats on a lot of airplanes, and those planes have flown through countless clouds. But my plane's window never really got soaked unless it was raining. So do clouds really house tiny droplets of water, or ice crystals, and then release them when it's just simply time to rain? And another question is, what about lightning? What is it? What causes it? Science says that it happens whenever heavier, negatively charged particles sink to the bottom of clouds. And when the positive and negative charges grow large enough, a giant spark, called lightning, occurs between the two charges within those clouds. And what about the northern and southern lights? 
science says they're polar lights, a natural phenomenon found in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Science says that they're created when charged particles from the sun strike atoms in Earth's atmosphere. And that causes electrons in the atoms to move to a higher energy state. And when the electrons drop back to a lower energy state, they release a photon, light. This process is what's supposed to create the beautiful aurora, or northern and southern lights. But I gotta ask, has mankind really figured all of this out? All the way down to an alleged particle, electron, atom, and photon level? And what about airplanes that leave strange cloud-like trails? What about these trails that linger and transform into clouds that resemble spider webs? And what about trails being left where no plane seems to be present? Because I personally recorded this video the day before the solar eclipse in August of 2017. I was looking at this cool rainbow perfectly encircling the sun. And when I started to record the trail and look for the airplane, I couldn't see one. I couldn't see the plane that was leaving this trail. And I did not edit or remove an airplane from this video. I wouldn't know where to start with something like that. But this trail is moving pretty fast across the sky. That's why my video is moving so much and it's hard for me to stay in focus or actually get ahead of the trail itself. And my camera was on a tripod while I was recording this. But there is no plane that I can find. And other people have recorded the same kind of stuff. They've even recorded odd looking orbs of light. Maybe you can explain this away. But once you personally start observing this place and the skies, I think you're going to witness the exact same thing. And you're going to start questioning so much about this place that you live. But that's not the end of it when it comes to airplanes in the sky. Because what happens when airplanes fly too close to the sun? I mean, what is happening here? Why does it look like the light from the sun is being dragged by this airplane? I've seen the same effect with birds moving across the sun too. And I have to tell you that ever since I started looking up, I've seen and recorded some amazing things and so many more things that I couldn't catch on camera. Of course, I have a lot of questions and there are a lot of things that I wonder. That's why I keep researching and looking for the truth. But right now, I'm experiencing Earth like never before with eyes wide open because I contend there's a lot that we don't know, but there's also a lot that we can research and discover through simple observations and more. Yes, we may be wrong about some stuff, but we may also be right about a lot of things. And as of now, based on everything that I've researched, I don't believe that we ever went to the moon because I don't believe there is an outer space in the way that we've been taught. So I don't believe that we can leave this earth. And I believe the earth is flat. And it seems we could be living inside a simulation. So I believe we're living during extremely interesting times. And in these times, I believe strange truths can be researched, discovered, and revealed like never before. So I have shared a lot in a relatively short amount of time. And I'm asserting that it's all based on the true story. Right now though, I'm just praying that I've at least offered something that can open doors to new possibilities inside your life because maybe there's more to what we've been told about this realm. Of course, I remain fully aware that what I've shared can close people's minds too. So I know that some people won't believe any of this, or they'll refuse to consider the potential in these things, because maybe they think what I've shared sounds too strange to be true. But I believe I've shared strangeness that has a better chance at being truth than the popular options. But maybe you have more questions regardless of what I present as strange truth, or regardless of what you believe so far. Two immediate questions are probably how and why. How could they cover all of this up? How could they fool everyone? Of course, I do not have all of the answers, but I'll take a run at these questions. My first reaction is that they haven't covered it all up. They haven't fooled everyone. It just seems that most people aren't questioning much of anything these days. A lot of people don't even look up at the sky anymore because most people have a lot going on. They're just trying to make sure that their kids finish their homework at night. They're just trying to lose a few pounds. They're just trying to keep the bills paid. They're just trying to scrape together enough money for the holidays. 
Maybe even take a fun vacation once a year. They are tired. They are busy. They're overwhelmed. Believe me, I know. But despite that, it does seem like more people are starting to look around. More people are starting to notice things. And it seems that people are starting to wake up to maybe, just maybe, everything does not add up. Another question would be, how could so many people be involved with this kind of deception without someone exposing these strange truths? This is a harder one to answer, but again, I'll take a run at it because I often wonder the exact same thing. How could some of the people involved not go public or become whistleblowers? Well, it turns out that there are people claiming they're coming forward. These people often claim to have worked somewhere inside a special agency or a division, and these people state they're sharing secret information. If you look into it, you will find people who claim some astonishing things about the sky and earth and more. And some of those people become well-known figures inside that conspiracy theory circle. But then some people die surrounding strange circumstances after coming forward, and some people just disappear after coming forward. I'm just not sure, so I'm often left wondering what really happened. So above all, I've got to research this place with people that I trust while leaning on my own senses and my own instincts and my own logic and my own reason. And then I've got to make the choice of what I believe to be truth. But again, I've got to heavily rely on what I can actually experience, feel, and observe because I can no longer strictly rely on what other people claim to be truth. I can no longer subscribe to viewpoints about life here on earth just because someone I know or don't know says it's true. Just like you shouldn't simply believe everything I'm offering here. You need to do some work. You need to seek the answers to your own questions so you can confirm or deny the validity of these strange truths. Doesn't that seem logical? All right, now let's move into another big question. The why. Because if this is true, why would people hide this? Why would they lie? This one's a lot easier for me to try and answer. Because think about it. If Earth was a spinning ball, then that means that it all started with the Big Bang, which simply put is a scientific theory stating that the universe began with a singularity, and then space-time expanded. And then from that Big Bang moment, everything evolved, transformed, and changed over billions of years, eventually leading to life, which began with single-cell organisms. And those single-cell organisms evolved, transformed, and changed, and they eventually became sophisticated life forms like you and me. It just took billions of years for humans to become the one-of-a-kind specimens that we are today. And if the Big Bang and evolution are true, that means the universe is constantly expanding. And if the universe is constantly expanding, that would mean there's infinite space out there to explore and visit. And that would definitely mean that our little rock known as Earth would be rotating around our local star known as the Sun. And that would mean similar solar systems to ours could happen in other parts of the universe. And that means there could be other evolved, intelligent life forms out there just like you and me. And that means Earth would basically be a grain of sand in a universe growing larger by the nanosecond. And that means Earth is not the heart of anything. That means our entire existence is pretty much an evolutionary accident. And that means life here on Earth, it has no real meaning or purpose. But if the Earth was flat, then that means that the Earth could be a firm and immovable plane. And that means there would be no Big Bang, no outer space, no expanding universe. And that means there would be nothing out there to visit and explore. And that means Earth could be the center of everything. And that means Earth could be an enclosed environment. And that means Earth could be a simulation being ran for you and me and every single person living here. And that means our entire existence inside this place is not an accident. That means life here on Earth is special. And that would mean that you and I are significant. And that would lead to many more questions. Like who created this place? Who put us here? Why were we put here? What is the meaning of all of this? And I believe that all of these answers can be found in the scriptures. Except the word which is supposed to be our guidebook it has become the opposite of almost everything we're witnessing in this place right now. Because right now, 
Science gets held up on a pedestal. Its theories are preached as facts, leading to science being worshipped like it's a god of revelations. And we all know that mankind is the one teaching science. And we all know that mankind is capable of being deceitful, selfish, and straight up evil. And that means the truth about earth could have been intentionally concealed to hide the existence of a creator. And that means the truth could have been corrupted over generations because eventually that leads to people just being indoctrinated into the deception from birth. And that leads to people getting programmed into accepting the opposite of what they actually observe and experience. And I gotta say that there seems to be a deep rabbit hole of lies because we are being taught some twisted things here. And we end up seeking these twisted teachings despite what our spirit, our minds, our hearts, and our souls tell us to seek and believe. Because we've been taught to serve our physical bodies and satisfy them. We've been taught to possess and achieve all of these things to feel and become whole. But I believe we were supposed to experience this place in such a different and blessed way. We were supposed to look to truth as a foundation for living. We were supposed to appreciate our similarities and also respect the uniqueness within our differences. We were supposed to help each other without a fiat money system driving our daily actions. We were supposed to share Earth's abundance of beauty and resources. We were supposed to respect everything on Earth. But the enemy has taken control of so much here, and that spoiled what this place was meant to be. The scriptures say this has, is, and will be the case. The scriptures also say that we're not meant for this life, not forever, because there's no way around the pure truth that you and I will die someday. So we all know that any physical treasures that we obtain here, they cannot be taken beyond this life. So I believe we're meant for so much more. And I believe what we all do while we're here, it's critical. Because the scriptures say our lives here are a way for our Father to help us. I believe we're His children. I believe He uses this place to help test us and to help develop our character, our faith, our obedience, our love, our integrity, our loyalty, and so much more. Because the scriptures use words like trials, temptations, refining, testing, hundreds of times. And based on all of my research and the evidence I've studied, I believe with all of my body and my soul that the scriptures are truth. The scriptures are history and prophecy. So they act as a script for everything that has happened and will happen inside this place. But we get to choose the roles that will play inside the script. Will we seek the truth? Will we look to our Creator? Will we choose Him over ourselves or even each other? And I've discovered that the true name of our Creator, the God of the Bible, it turns out that His true name is Yahweh. You've probably seen this YHWH before. Here's what it looks like in ancient Hebrew. But this YHWH, it's pronounced as Yahweh. Because it turns out that the language was so simple back then that it vocalized each consonant with an ah sound without specifically marking that sound between consonants. So this YHWH, it's pronounced Yahawa. It also turns out that the name of Yahawa can be found over 7,000 times in the scriptures. And Yahawa, it means he exists. And Yahawa sent himself into human form as the Christ. And I've learned that the true name of the Christ is Yahawashai. Yes, most people know him by the name of Jesus, but that can't be his true name because the letter J didn't even exist until about 500 years ago. His true name is Yahawashai, and Yahawashai means he is salvation. Because the gospel, which can be found in the beginning verses of Corinthians chapter 15, Paul wrote that Yahawashai, the Christ, died by crucifixion to deliver us from our sins, and he was buried, and he rose again on the third day, and he was seen again by hundreds of eyewitnesses according to the scriptures. And I really do believe that this gospel must be truly believed and accepted to bind our soul with our Creator beyond this life. So that means I believe we've got to follow and live for Yahawashai to the best of our abilities. Still, I believe other choices are significant because all of this is really being experienced by you and me. 
I agree with many of my brothers and sisters who believe that all of this is being recorded. All of our actions, all of our thoughts, everything, I believe it's all being documented by our Creator. Because I believe our Creator is watching us, and I believe He encoded us with basic truths, like knowing the difference between right and wrong. Because I believe we've been given a moral compass that tells us when we make good or bad choices that affect ourselves or others. Except the original coding inside mankind seems to have been corrupted through generations of wicked choices where people continually turned away from our Father and lived for themselves. So that means there's a lot of evil in this place right now. And the scriptures say that our Creator has worked to purify this place before to start over. And the scriptures say He's going to remove the corruption once again. But the next time, it seems to be the last time before He makes things right forever. So I keep asking myself if he's going to do something about this place sooner than later. Because mankind has helped the enemy decay too much of this place. And there's so much that I can't wrap my head around. Because again, it seems so many things happen every single day all over the earth that contradict, defy, and disgrace what the scriptures say we're supposed to be doing here. Because it seems people have become desensitized to the climbing death tolls. And it seems that everyone's being told to suddenly forget what it took for us to still be here. And it seems that people who can't help themselves are lost for the most part. And it seems that people are being ordered to accept things that they can't comprehend. And it seems that people of faith have been divided into sectors of Christianity to separate us from our common salvation. And it seems that people are okay with an elite group growing richer every day on the backs of debt slaves. And it seems that people have accepted things being spread and consumed without the true intentions of curing or healing. And it seems that people are just crying out for help because of how monstrous humans are treating each other. It just seems that so many things are backwards from what they are supposed to be. So yeah, when I look around, I wonder if Yahweh is going to do something about all of this. I wonder if the time is coming for him to fix his creation once and for all. I wonder if he's already trying to warn us. I wonder if he's trying to wake us up. Because there are a lot of strange events impacting the earth. People continue to be affected, displaced, and hurt surrounding these events. There are just so many strange things happening in so many places. So this broken world leads many Christians to believe that these are the last days. And many Christians believe the pre-tribulation rapture of the church could occur within our lifetime. Of course, many generations have believed this. I don't know if the church could be raptured in weeks, years, or decades, but I do believe it's possible in my lifetime. I pray it happens. But many Christians refuse to consider this possibility, except many people 2,000 years ago didn't believe they were living at the time of the Christ or that it was possible for the Christ to be walking the earth during their lifetime. And many Christians living today don't understand how those people from 2,000 years ago could have been so blind. I find that interesting because so many of those same Christians living today, they don't seem to be very open to the church being raptured in their lifetime. And they don't seem to think it's possible that Yahawashai could return to once again reign during their generation. But put aside the talk of last days. The truth is that any day could be our last day due to any unexpected event or accident. Yes, that sounds cliche, but it's truth. And that's why I believe we must embrace our common salvation. And I believe Yahweh is begging all of us to look to him. He wants to say that he knew us before meeting face to face at the time of our death. So straight up, I really want to help serve him. Because I believe Every strange truth that I've shared here can serve as a gateway for people to come to the truth about a creator. And I believe that path leads to the truth about Yahawashai, our Savior. That is why I'm touching on this again right now. Just in case you weren't aware, historical scholars, Christian and non-Christian, generally agree that Yahawashai lived at the time the scriptures say he lived. And those scholars also agree he was crucified and buried. What they don't agree on is whether he truly rose from the dead and if the eyewitness testimony can be trusted and if he was really the son of the creator. But there is general agreement that he lived, he was crucified, and he was buried. 
So that means Yahweh Shai was either Yahweh in human form or he was a complete nutcase. Because if he was not really the son of Yahweh, then he was just some lunatic, insane guy who proclaimed to be our savior. I'm sorry, but he can't have made those claims and still be a good person spreading a moral message. It's all or none here. So that's why I believe that this video may be the most important thing that I've ever done. Because if these strange truths are right, then this stuff could wake up people and help them move mountains of deception. These strange truths could reveal that we were created and that Yahweh put us here for a reason. Imagine if everyone learned that knowledge. Imagine if everyone knew that when they died, they'd have to literally meet their maker. Do you think that people would make different life choices with that knowledge? Do you think that people would treat themselves, others, and everything on earth better? So what do you do next if you're open to this being the truth? Maybe you'll watch this video again to determine what you want to research first. Maybe you'll observe the celestial bodies. Maybe you'll test for curvature across the earth. Maybe you'll record and look for clouds behind the sun. Maybe you'll open a Bible and read it for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time. Maybe you'll call upon the name of Yahawashai to be saved right now. And then maybe you'll ask him to lead you to the next step. No matter what, I challenge you to observe your surroundings. Look up. Look around. Challenge what you've been taught. Research what doesn't make sense. Because I think you'll be surprised at what you find. But maybe you'll have a different take on what I've shared here. Maybe we could talk about those differences. Maybe we could talk about the other strange things that didn't make it into this video. Maybe we could work together and unite to change this place into something better. Because maybe we're capable of doing anything that we can imagine. And maybe you'll be open to sharing the strange truth. Maybe you'll sit down with your significant other and show them this video. Or maybe you'll send this video to another friend to get their opinion so that you can talk about it with someone you trust. But whether or not you end up believing, accepting, or sharing this video, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you because you watched this entire video. And I sincerely appreciate you doing that. I am so grateful for you just being open to watching this. So thank you for honoring my request and straight up, thank you for being special. Thank you for being significant. Okay, so I don't really know the best way to end this thing because this Strange Truth Project, it has consumed so much of my life for the past year. And it's still kind of crazy when I stop and think about all of this because it's still hard for me to process at times and I actually believe all of this. So that obviously means that I also believe I'll have to meet my creator someday. And that means that I'll have to answer him if he asks me, did you help share the truth? I pray that I've done my due diligence. I pray that I am doing what's right. Yeah, I pray. <laughs>